Welcome back everybody. In this episode, we're installing a diesel heater into our Jayco journey. Now there has to be 3000 videos on installing these eBay diesel heaters into pretty much anything these days. But what I've done is I've consolidated all the tips, tricks, and improvements you can make to these diesel heaters to make the installation super easy and to make sure they work really, really well in your caravan, camp, trailer, or anything like that. So come along as we show you how. Now, how good is that? You can hardly hear the fuel pump in that custom enclosure. So I'm gonna mark that down as a huge success. Now, around four years ago, I did a video on this portable diesel heater that we use in our Jayco camper trailer. This has been a really good solution for us because we've been able to pull it out when we're not using it to actually free up some valuable storage space in that particular camper trailer. We did a full DIY video on how you can duct in the air from the outside. We learned a lot with this diesel heater, so much that I had to do a follow-up video on it. But that video has had over 280,000 views. It just blows my mind. So now I'm going to look at doing a fixed diesel heater install. And noting that everyone's going to have a slightly different situation, I want to focus more on the tips, tricks, and improvements you can make to these built-in diesel heaters that also apply to the portable ones, mind you, to help everyone out and consolidate all the information that's out there on the internet to hopefully provide a really good user-friendly guide, which is what I like to do as part of these videos. So instead of just doing a unboxing video showing all the components that go into a typical eBay diesel heater kit, I'm gonna show you a few things you can change up to improve them and make them work a lot better. So you'll notice here we've got a different diesel tank, I've got this little apparatus here, which I'm playing around with to silence down the ticking noise you get from the pump. I've got an upgraded pump and a whole heap of different things, including you know new mounting hardware, all the little bits and pieces you change up to make these work really, really well. And I'm also going to introduce a few of my own little improvements to things like the control panel, how it mounts and all that sort of thing. So I think it'll be really, really interesting. But to mix things up a little bit, I'm not just gonna run through everything, all the components now, and then go through the installation. What I think we'll actually do is do it step by step. So we'll run through the heater itself, we'll get that installed, then we'll do the tank and the fuel system, then we'll go through the electrical so it can be broken up, and that will also allow us to create chapters like we do with all our videos, so you can skip backwards and forwards depending on what stage of the install you're up to. Also, I list in the YouTube description down below all the components I use in pretty much every single video. So if you're after this mounting plate, I'll have that in there. If you're wondering what this is and the brackets, I'll have them listed with links in the YouTube video description as well. So it makes it incredibly easy for anyone out there. But before we get into all of this, I wanna firstly run through positioning your equipment within your camp trailer or your caravan to make life a little bit easier with the install. Because as everyone knows, preparation is the key. So I think it's important to look at where you're going to install the heater itself, your fuel tank, run your lines, and everything that drops out from the bottom of your camp trailer or your caravan because you have a real hot exhaust that drops down. You, want, you have your air inlet, you've got your fuel coming in, and you want to mount it all fairly close to the battery if you can. So there's a lot of little things to be wary of when you're installing these, and that's where I come into play because I like doing all that research and consolidating it all together. If you're looking to install it, say, into a Jayco camper trailer, I would approach it something like this. So if we bring up the floor plan here, this is the general layout of, say, a Jayco Swan. You're gonna locate the heater somewhere up in this corner. And that's because that's where you don't normally have things stored where you're trying to get some easy access to it. It's a little hidden corner over in the back side of the lounge. And that really makes sense for a number of factors because right next to it, you typically have your battery and your battery management system. So that allows a really short run of the cabling from the battery directly to the heater unit. And we'll get into that towards the back end of the video when we're wiring it all back up. And now wherever possible, I think it's a great idea to install these diesel heaters on the driver's side of your caravan, camp trailer or anything like that. Because that allows the exhaust to go out on the open side. Noting that most people will probably have an awning, an annex or something like that on the passenger side where the door is. So you don't want all the exhaust going into that covered in area. It also keeps the sound onto that far side, so it's not so obtrusive into the area where you're trying to sit and relax while you're out and about and camping. 
Now with the camper trailers you have a number of different options where you can mount the diesel tank. You can mount it externally on the drawbar, probably behind where the jerry can mount is. A lot of people use that and that will allow you to easily run the fuel line back into your heater system with no dramas at all. Now you do have another option with the Jayco camper trailers in that you could place a fuel can inside the boot area. Now the advantage here is that keeps your fuel system out of the weather. It's not in direct sunlight or anything like that. And that will actually keep the tank, the lines and everything in really good condition. Keeps it all out of sight and makes for a pretty fuss free installation. So in the camper trailers it's really easy to get the ducting out to that under lounge area to warm the inside of your camp trailer with no real fuss at all. Now what about if you're installing it into a caravan? Well again, I would take the approach of trying to keep it on that driver's side. Now a lot of caravans have the lounge area on the far side. That is a really good position, similar to the camper trailers where you might be able to position the heater right on the driver's side of the caravan, in behind where you normally have some drawers that you use for storage and easy access, in behind a wheel well or something like that. The only thing that you need to be conscious of, and we'll get into that as we go through the video, is making sure there's no services, structure or anything like that underneath where you need to make the penetrations for your exhaust, your fresh air, and all that stuff to go in under the caravan itself. Now a lot of people will also install under the main bed area. In our case, we've actually got the gas hot water system there, so it actually makes sense that we could put the diesel heater up the front of the caravan, but the one little inconvenience we've got is on the front of the caravan, we don't have a really good spot to put the diesel tank because there's not really anything there to clip it onto. And we don't really have a decent boot area up the front where we might put a tank as well. So for us, it became a little bit of a problem solving exercise because our batteries are located right up the back of the van in our lower bunk area. But we actually have a secondary boot area on our passenger side, which works really, really well for putting a diesel tank into. So if I just bring up the floor plan of our Jayco Journey, which is a 17.58-1. So this is the 17 foot bunk model that doesn't have the ensuite. Under the bunk area, we've also got our external shower, our dual batteries, and obviously our battery management system. And in this area in between, we've got a bit of a no man's land where we don't typically store too much. And it's in a zone where it actually makes sense to install a diesel heater. So we're gonna plonk one just over on the far side, in between our batteries and our external shower. And you'll see when we get to the underside of the caravan, that makes it really easy to plumb everything in and out with too much drama at all. Now, quite a few caravans will actually have a spare wheel mounted to the back bumper here. That is the perfect location if you're mounting your unit towards the rear to put a diesel tank in behind that spare wheel. Now, if we move to the front side of the caravan, you've got a few different opportunities where you might be able to mount a diesel tank. Now, Jayco, as standard, has a jerry can holder generally on the front of all their camp trailers and caravans. What some people will do is, again, mount onto the back of that jerry can holder, and that's a really good location to put a nice slimline tank. The other option, particularly with our instance here, would be to mount it behind the gas bottles in a similar sort of arrangement. Now you might have to make some custom brackets, something like that to actually mount it on, but they're two really good positions on the front of the caravan where you can discreetly mount something and it's not just sitting out there and particularly on the front of the caravan getting hammered by all the rocks and stones that you might throw up while you're traveling, particularly down dirt roads. So that's just a broad idea of what you wanna look at when you're installing a diesel heater into anything that you're looking to do. And it's really, really important to get underneath and have a look at where all your structure and services run, because if you go to put the heater in and drill some holes in, they're non-reversible and you've got a whole heap of infrastructure underneath that stops things going in and out, it'll make your life really, really hard. So have a good look around, work out an ideal location to put your diesel heater, all the ancillaries that go with it that we'll go through as part of this video and you'll be having a really good time and it'll make for a really easy install. So now let's get into the diesel heater itself and I'll run through some tips and tricks there and also how we go about mounting it inside your camper trailer or your caravan. Now when it comes to these diesel heater kits, you will note that there's a few different sizes out on the market. They range from two kilowatts that we've got here up to the larger five and eight kilowatt units, which are typically in the freestanding units. Now, there's a few different schools of thought here and you can take whichever one you want. The theory is these larger units 
they're usually oversized for a camp trailer, caravan or anything like that. So it means that you're actually running them fairly soft and that can potentially create an issue where they sort up. Now in a camper trailer, you'll typically run the unit a lot hotter. So we haven't had any issues with this carboning up or sooting up from not having a really hot burn. But when you go to install into a caravan, they're a lot more well sealed. So I've actually gone the two kilowatt unit. Now the theory here is that diesel heaters like being run hard and hot. So that means you're burning off all the carbon and soot buildup, and you're not getting the problems that a lot experience down the track. Now another little tip that some people do is they mix a little bit of kerosene in with the diesel so it burns a lot cleaner as well. The two kilowatt units are smaller than the larger five kilowatt. And I don't know if you can really tell here, but if I put it up, the five and eight kilowatt units, which are generally the same, they've just got slightly different nozzle injectors inside them, are about probably 25% larger in size to these two kilowatt units. Not a really big thing, but the operation of them I think is really important. Now, if I put this down, the other thing is people are always, always talking about what's a good brand to buy or anything like that. Now my thinking with this is pretty much anything that comes out of China, look, no matter what the brand is, it's all kind of the same. Now you do also have a number of Australian suppliers of the cheaper eBay diesel heater units. The advantage that you're going to get from buying through someone like Harvey Norman or Dick Smith or any of those resellers these days is you might get a little bit of backup warranty support. But I'm not going to say it's going to be all that great and not that much. Now the other option you do have is buying a diesel heater setup and combo from some of the other providers. Now they, they are pretty much based on the same thing but they come with a lot of upgraded components and hardware that we're going to go through in this video to make the install a little bit easier. You obviously get that backup and support that you get from those suppliers. So you have diesel heat down in Tasmania and we've got a few things from them to actually enhance our system because they're a really good company that everyone recommends. And there's a few other companies around which I'll have linked in to the description below for some more expensive kits. So you're going to be paying a little bit more, probably around six or seven hundred dollars. You just need to weigh that up against buying one of these straight from China eBay kits which you know you're getting for around let's say $100 to $150 pretty much any day of the week. What you do want to look at is the control panels because they do change a little bit. Now I bought this unit 12 months ago and if you start looking through videos the control panels do change as they go through and they're getting better with every single year. So just go through and work out which control panel is better and it usually comes down to the actual display or the graphics that you get on the unit. But this is the typical one that came with all the units 12 months ago and I think it's still fairly common. You have the older style one which is actually on the front of this that has the blue on it. This is the newer control panel that goes in and above that. Now most of the cheaper ones won't have a proper temperature control in, in that it's got a thermostat on the display. It, you're really just adjusting the hertz, which is the frequency that the pump actually pumps the diesel from the tank into the heater itself, and that's what causes that ticking noise. People will run for years and years and years with these. It's just you've got to follow the operating procedure, which is when you turn these off, you've got to let them run down. You can't just cut the power to them. The worst thing you can do with a diesel heater is instantly cut the power to it, that will cause a lot of issues down the track. So you want to turn it off via the control panel, let it go through its cool down cycle, and you'll find that you'll generally have no dramas at all. So now let's get into how you install this inside your caravan or camper trailer because there's a few little things you can do to make life a little bit easier. So we'll just move the portable diesel heater off to the side and we'll get into the installation of these fixed units. With the units themselves, you'll notice they come in a plastic case you have a grill on one side. Now that is your cold air in, and then the open side is your hot air out. So inside your camp trailer or your caravan, you're taking the, the warm air, I would say, in through this side, it's heating it up and, it, and expelling it out through the duct and into your caravan or camp trailer from the open side. Now if you take that same theory, when you look underneath, there's two ports underneath. Your cold side is also your cold in, which is your air intake for the combustion chamber, and then the hot side is your exhaust out. Now, I messed that up with our 
original video on the diesel heater because I didn't quite understand the instructions. Obviously I did run it like that but I get a lot of comments on it. But the easy way to remember when you're locating these and connecting everything up that cold to cold, hot to hot, will generally have everything in the right way. Now on the underside it's important to think about that. So in our particular instance we're going to be installing it this way. So this is the front of the caravan and this is the rear. So I've got the hot air coming out once it's gone through the heater and that will go into our bunk side of the caravan. But that's an important consideration because that determines where the hot air or the exhaust and everything comes out down the bottom. So in our case, this front port will be our exhaust so we can take it out and shoot it out through the side of the caravan without too many dramas at all. Now what some people like to do is you'll have this other duct coming out that will have your little silencer or filter on it for the combustion air that comes in. Now you don't want that facing forward necessarily because that will get caked with mud and dirt. You want it hanging backwards if you can. So in our case that works really well. That hangs out towards the back of the caravan and it means it's not going to get all gunked up and dirty so much even though it's on the underside of the caravan. And you want to make sure that when you're routing everything that you're keeping this fuel line away from the exhaust which is coming in on this side. So again you've got your cold and your fuel line you can separate out and then you can run your exhaust perpendicular or at least off to the side so that you're not getting any you know heat melting your fuel line or any wiring or anything like that in particular. So it just makes it a lot easier to install when you think about how these ports work and how it's positioned inside your caravan or camper trailer. Now the next thing to consider is how this mounts in through the floor. Now the kits typically provide this little mounting plate and you can see here that this heat plate actually slides over your ports and your mounting points on the bottom of the diesel heater. So it would sit up like this. Now there's a few issues and considerations with this. You probably put some fire rated sealant onto the bottom of this and try to screw it down. But because you need to open up all the holes to get all to these mounting points, there's a few aftermarket additions that have come in to solve this. The first thing you do is you actually go and buy a downpipe spout from Bunnings. So it's a fielder's downpipe spout, just like this. And what that does is that, is that provides a collar. So you still cut a big hole into the bottom floor of your camp trailer or caravan. And it does exactly what this does here. So what we're going to use is one of these eBay items. And now there's someone actually local to us in Newcastle that makes a really good stainless steel version for around about $60. Now I've had this around for quite some time. And fortunately I actually bought the right one. Because if you look at the bottom of this mounting plate, there's actually this slot that comes out on a lot of the adapters and aftermarket mounting plates you get. But these units actually have a rubber gasket on the bottom of them and this will quite often, as you can see, it goes out past. So if I put my finger down here, you can actually see my finger coming through. So if you seal this onto the bottom of the caravan, you often have a little bit of a hole and that particularly relates to these floor mounts Whereas that slot goes out and you seal it in, you do have a bit of an area where weather can penetrate into the floor of your caravan or camper trailer. So if you're looking to buy one of these, there's a few different styles out there. Firstly, get the one that doesn't have that little slot off to the side. And then if you want to, there's newer ones out there that actually, actually cut all this out to make it easier to fit everything in. The other thing to consider is quite a few of them will have a 30 mil or a 70 mil, I think, sort of collar that comes out through the bottom. Now, if you're installing this into a typical Australian caravan or camp trail, it doesn't have a real thickly insulated floor. We've just got a plywood floor. You only really need the 30 mil, and that's just to provide that transition from the floor to the underside, so you can seal it all up and make it all look nicey nice. Now, I think this is the best solution out there, but the one thing I've come across is that this on mine is around 130 millimeters in diameter. Now the problem you'll come across with those is that most hole saws that you buy from Bunnings or anywhere like that, I did find some hole saws on Amazon so you might get pretty close to the actual penetration size, are around 127 millimeters, which you'll note is a little bit smaller than the collar we're installing this into, which does become a little bit problematic but I've actually used a jigsaw to open up the hole. 
I've also got some more suitable hardware so we can install this mounting plate into the floor of our caravan. And now because we're dealing with heat in this area, I have actually gone out and bought some fire rated sealant. So this is a sicker product and it's still a neutral cure which you should be using with your caravans, camp trailers and everything like that because it's not an acidic so it's not promoting rust or anything like that even though we're generally dealing with wooden floors and you know powder coated bits and pieces. It's just a good security to actually use a fire rated sealant just to make sure everything's sealed in nicely because you want to make sure no water or moisture ingress is going to come in but if it does get a little bit warm and toasty it's just a little bit of extra security. You'll probably never have to rely on this fire rated sealant but I think it's good peace of mind if something was to go wrong and particularly if you weren't in the direct vicinity of the caravan or camp trailer to monitor what's going on. So we'll head out to the caravan now. I've already got the hole in and I'll show you what I did to do that and how I went about placing this unit, little things I looked out for and then we'll get all this mounted in and move on to the fuel system. Now before we head inside the journey itself, I want to cover off the underside so that you've got a few pointers to look out for when you're looking to place a diesel heater itself. So obviously we've selected this zone down under here. We've got our shower here which consumes a little bit of the air out under our bunks that sit up through here. And then we've obviously got all our batteries and battery management system on this side. The most important thing about selecting this area is if you look underneath the caravan, you'll notice on the outside of the frame, behind the back wheels, we've got a nice clean and clear area where there's no surfaces where we can cut a nice decent hole in, get our exhaust out of the way and we're not having to worry about any services. If we go on the other side of this frame, you'll see that we've got a lot of our water pipe work and cabling and bits and pieces running down, particularly to the shower at the back of the van and also to our lights and all that sort of gear. Now while I'm under here, I'm actually going to measure from the outside to the inside frame there and that will allow us to actually put a marking inside the floor inside the caravan so we can look at how we can actually position the unit in around the batteries and all that sort of gear. So let's head inside. Now it's a little bit tricky to film in here and as you can see I've stepped ahead a little bit because I've got this scraping big hole but I want to quickly run through some tips and tricks to help you out when you're going to mount these diesel heaters. So we're up the back of our caravan where we've got our bunks and we've got this perfect area underneath which has the shower on one side and the batteries on the front side in behind the rear well as you can see here. So we've got this clear area in between the batteries and the rear of the van where you can see the plumbing going into the shower and that is a perfect spot to mount a diesel heater. Now before you go cutting great big holes for these units you want to make sure you're putting them in the right spot and as I said outside you're not interfering with any of the structure or services underneath on the underside of the floor. So what I've done is I've actually measured out from the side and marked with some tape the line of the substructure underneath where we want to make sure that we're clear. So what you want to do is position this heater down on the floor, move it around a little bit and get a feel for how it's going to fit inside the space you've got to work with. The other really important thing is that you've got it worked out how your exhaust and combustion air inlet on the bottom of the unit is going to work. Remembering the open side of the heater, that's your hot side. So you've got the exhaust coming out the bottom and also the hot air coming out into the space that you're trying to heat. And you need a good deal of access to be able to clamp all the hoses and pipes and everything onto the underside of these units. So it's just something you need to go through. As you can see here, we can get our recirculated air in through the back on the other side. Here we can get our ducting out down the side of the batteries. That's no drama at all. And we're going to do another triple check while we're doing the hole to make sure we're not going to cause any issues. And I'll show you that as the next few steps. So now we get to the scary bit, which is cutting this great big hole. Now, as I said in the shed, this hole is going to be a little bit small for this particular outlet, but as opposed to making like a 150 mil hole, which is going to be too big for the mounting plate, I think this will be a really good start. So what I'm actually going to do before I put this hole saw on is I'm going to mark the center of the hole that we need to drill. And I'm going to put a pilot hole through to the underside of the van. And now that we've got that pilot hole in, we're going to go to the underside of the van and check to see how this fits to make sure that we've got all our measurements correct. So now that we're happy where the hole is, I've got my second hole drilled, I can now use a hole saw. Now the trick here is to actually come up from the bottom 
So that way you're not going to destroy the underside of the floor. If you just do this from inside all the way through, when this cut starts to cut and penetrate through the bottom, particularly of a plywood floor, it'll splinter it and make a real mess of it. So to keep it tidy, go halfway up from the bottom and then finish the cut from the top. Even though we're now getting the jigsaw to open that hole up, it just means we've got a nice clean area that we're working with. Also vacuum clean up all the sawdust through each of the stages while I'm going, just to make sure the area I'm working in is all nice and clean. You wanna make sure you've got some decent light in there as well, because otherwise you can't really see what you're doing. So now it's just a case of getting the jigsaw and we're gonna open the hole up. Now in my particular instance here, I'm actually, I've noticed running around the outside of the line. I would probably, if I was gonna do it again, run around the inside a little bit closer. I wanted to make sure that I had enough wriggle room there to actually get the mounting plate in and square it all up when I got in in the floor. As it turns out, I actually had a little bit more space there, but it's not the end of the world because we can seal all that up. I would just try to make it a little bit tighter if I was to do it again. So now we've caught up in the video and we've got the hole in the bottom of our van, and now it's time to put this mounting plate in. So what I'm going to do is actually run a bead of that fire rated silicon in around the bottom here so that it seals onto the bottom of the floor. You probably don't need to put too much around the actual bottom of the plate itself. It's more trying to seal around the penetration where this sleeve goes down through the bottom of the floor. And then in particular, we're gonna seal it really, really well from the bottom of the floor up. We'll plonk that into place, then we can screw it all down. And that's where I've got that upgraded hardware, which will just work a little bit better in the thickness of the ply we've got on the bottom of the van. The place, and you'll notice a little bit of silicon. We'll probably seek out from the seams here and there. You just want to go around with some soapy water and clean that up as much as you can. Have some paper towel on hand just to make the clean up a little bit easier. And with these textured vinyl floors, it's a little bit hard to get it out of the grain, particularly with the timber look. So just try to keep it as tight as you can without making too much of a mess and you'll have a really neat install. And here's how it looks from underneath. You can see you just gotta to try to keep that grey silicon as tight as you can. There's your exhaust port, there's your inlet port, and here's our fuel port. So you can see where the 30 mil flange, particularly on the Jayco products, it works perfectly. If you had a 75 mil, it'll be way down here somewhere. So I'll just quickly place this into the mounting plate. So it's sitting there and ready to go, but we'll head back into the shed and run through the fuel side of things, because that's where it gets really interesting. And now we're at the point where we're starting to assemble the fuel system. And there's a few little factors through here that you might find really interesting. But before we get into all the tanks and stuff like that, let's talk about this little area here, which is fuel pumps, and more importantly, trying to keep them quiet. Now diesel heaters are famous for that tick, tick, tick sound they make. And that primarily is generated by this, which is the fuel pump. Now, there's a few things you can do to improve these straight out of the box. Firstly, following the instructions, but just understanding how they work. So the general operation of these fuel pumps is they're a pusher style pump. So the fuel comes in from this end, it compresses and pushes it out through the other end. This is where you plug your harness in. And generally, most manufacturers will say that you shouldn't mount it horizontally like this. You should mount it at around about 30 degrees. So people say around about, you know, somewhere between 25 and 45 degrees is perfect for mounting these fuel pumps. And what that aims to do is to reduce the cavitation inside the pump and the noise generated from that. So it allows the air to get out rather than building up pockets of air inside it. And that will actually quieten these pumps down quite a bit. And now there's a few other things you can do to help the situation. Firstly, you need to look at mounting. So you need to put it on an angle like this you ideally want to get it outside of a echoey sort of space. So I wouldn't mount this inside under a bed or anything like that because that reverberation will carry through the caravan or camp trailer you're trying to put it in. And you want to isolate this from any structure or body of the caravan, camp trailer, RV or anything you're installing this in. So the simplest way is to buy one of these rubber collars, which is a hanger for the fuel pump. So the fuel pump simply slides in like so. It's a pretty tight fit, so I had to muck around with trying to slip this on. But this essentially suspends the fixing or mounting point of the fuel pump off the structure you're mounting it onto. So in most cases, you're probably gonna mount it to the underside into the framing of your caravan or camp trailer or something like that. And the idea is this provides 
a little bit of resonance protection so the vibration from this isn't going up and vibrating through the structure you're mounting it on. Now it's got a little bush here so that you can screw it and fix it onto say the side structure of your camp trailer. But what I would also do is actually put a rubber mount in between so that it's a little bit more isolated or something like that. Now this may help, but there's a few other things you can do and that's what we're going to explore as part of this video. The first thing is you can actually buy these silent fuel pumps. Now the jury's out on how silent they really are. They still do have a tick, tick, tick. It is slightly less, but it's not quite so tinny or metallic. So straight out of the box, these will make a very big difference. Even if you mount it in the rubber collar like I just shown, it probably will work quite well. But what a lot of people are doing with these, and even the standard fuel pumps for that matter, is to mount these inside another enclosure so you can sort of muffle the noise and contain it within a box. And that's where I've been fiddling around a little bit by trying to come up with a bit of a solution. And what you see here is an array of a few different things I've gone through to try to come up with that. So the simplest solution would be to put it inside some kind of plastic box or container, connect all your fuel lines, your wiring and everything in, and then encase it in like spray on expander foam. You cut that off, put the lid on, you could even tape it up or something like that. And that does actually prove to be quite a good solution. Now that box itself, you want a rubber mount onto whatever you're fixing it onto or hang it or suspend it somehow. Again, so any vibration isn't transferred all the way through to whatever you're mounting it onto. So you can sort of get the general theme here. So I've actually been looking at a few different options. And the first thing is an electrical junction box. So this is what Sparky's use quite often inside the roof space of your house. It's an area where you can sort of join a whole heap of cables together you cut holes out and you keep it all nice and tidy. Now, because it all clicks together and it can be mounted onto something, looks quite neat and it's not obtrusive when you look at it from the outside. I figured this would be a really good start. And it nearly works because you can actually mount this in on a diagonal. You can have your hose going out from either end. And my idea is to foam fill this. So fill it full of foam. We're gonna wrap this fuel pump with some foam as well and see how well that isolates things. Now the problem with this, with how I want to mount it, is that it's going to be seen from the outside of the caravan. So I wanted to come up with something that didn't look like just a box plonked onto the side and it's probably on too much of an angle for what I'm trying to do. Now you can turn it this way and I can mount it in like this but it, it needs to be going in this direction for my installation. And what I run into is actually these mounts on either side. They sort of run into what I'm trying to do here and I can't really get it to work. So as I do, I walked around Bunnings and I was hunting around for some solutions, some other containers or some other thing that you could use to put these together. And I came across firstly this, which is an Arlec you know, a join up for electrical cables. So you put your 240 volt extension cords in here, you join them together, you close this over, and that stops them being pulled apart if someone trips over them or something like that. And this actually works quite well because it's got some uh, rubber bushings on either end to sort of compress your fuel line where it goes in, and it should be fairly water resistant. Now, Arlick with this particular one, they say it is for indoors, and I want to mount it externally, obviously because as we'll see shortly, you want to mount this underneath, not inside the space where it's going to echo and create too much noise. And it actually, from a size point of view, works quite well. But because it's indoor rated, I went hunting around for something that was outdoor rated. Now this, I actually already had at home for the Christmas lights we put up from time to time. So this is just another option that Bunnings sell. This is a click item. This potentially could work quite well, except it looks like a soy sauce sachet that you get with your Asian food or a fish or something like that. It, it just looks a little bit odd, but it's a little bit big and bulky compared to the Arlec one. And it, it, when you see the location I'm trying to put this, it took up a bit of room. So I went on Amazon to see if I could find, you know, an, a weatherproof or weather resistant version of this that might work. And that's how this has come about. It's essentially, I think, a ripoff of this Arlec one. Other than it's got 
four extra tabs on the outside in each of the four corners, I guess. The flap flips up exactly the same as the Arlec one. And when you open it up, it's kind of exactly the same, except I don't feel that these rubber ends are quite as good as the Arlec one, but it's black, so it's not as obtrusive from the outside and it will work pretty much the same. And it, I expected it to have some rubber gaskets like the Click one, but uh, they do say it's weather resistant. So I, I think for what we're trying to do, it will work quite well. So I've gone about working out how the fuel pump will fit inside it. These are quite good because as you can see here, the fuel pump fits really nicely in this area in between these tabs. Now, ideally you don't have all these grooves and bits and pieces, but I think we'll be able to work around that. And I might even try to pull some of these other little bits and pieces out. But if we close this up, on the back of it, you've got these two ribs that run down the side. So this will essentially be the flat part that we want to mount up against the frame of our caravan. Now, because we want to mount it on an angle, what I've done is I've drilled a hole on one end on this top side of the rib up here and then I've drilled another hole down here. And how I'm actually going to fix it onto the side of the van because I don't want to actually drill into the steel structure is I've got two of these angle brackets again that I bought from Bunnings. Now you do have to modify these very slightly if I bring this one up in that because they're sitting onto the roll of this actual tube, the one that sits at the top I've actually, if you can see here, I've bent it out slightly and then the one that sits on the bottom, I've bent it in. So the idea is that we can sit this like so and it will make a lot more sense when we get it onto the side of the caravan. And I can actually mount these brackets here onto the underside of the floor. So I can just use some simple timber screws to fix this onto the underside of the floor and I'm just using some simple M5 bolts. At the moment I've got these ones in here but I've bought some slightly longer ones. So I'll list in the description below the ones that I used and I'm using some nylock nuts to sort of squeeze it all together and make sure it doesn't vibrate apart when we're traveling down the road. But this to me will be a real neat and tidy solution that once it's bolted in place, it's not obstructive. Your fuel line goes in, it comes out and we're going to run the electrical harness in the bottom side as well. And it shouldn't really cause too many dramas. If you need to gain access to it, you can click this open, open it up and we can service the fuel pump with this still installed. So to me, this will be a really good, easy solution. But if we open this one without the brackets back up, the idea is to line the internals of this with some adhesive back foam that I've been using on a number of different projects. So I've got this as a strip and then I've got a big long roll of it as well. So you can either cut it off and layer it in like so or what I'll probably do is cut out some longer pieces and laminate that in to the insides which is essentially what you do with the sound deadening in a car. You want to line all the surfaces inside this enclosure to take the resonance out of it. But what I will do with this strip foam I've got is actually wrap the fuel pump in it as well, which again should stop a bit of the resonance. And depending how this fits in, I'm going to try to find some other open cell foam that I've got here somewhere. I'll just need to find it to tuck in around it as well, just to take up the air gap that's in there. But the air gap's probably not going to be a bad thing. A few moments later. And this is essentially what I've come up with. I've gone a little bit further and I'll show you what that product is. But I've essentially lined the main internal surfaces of this little enclosure and then you'll notice I've added a little foam frame that the pump actually sits into. So that will hold it into place. You can shut it, lock it all down and that keeps it all nice and firmly located and well insulated. So what I've actually added in and I'll just grab the piece of material that I've actually used is some of this Kin Chrome custom cut foam. So this is essentially what you put into a toolbox you can trace out all your tools and have a locator inside your toolbox. It's really easy to get from Bunnings. And again, I'll have a link in the description below. Now this material here is quite soft and what I would call sort of like an open cell foam design. 
very easy to cut and you can sort of shape and manipulate it to fit particularly in that rounded enclosure we're putting these into. It's very, very similar to a pool noodle. So potentially you could actually do all of this with a pool noodle if you can live with the color that the pool noodles come in. But that's essentially what I've used. I'll pull it out now and show you how it works. So if we pull the pump out, all I've done is just started carving into it so that we got the shape that the pump fits into and it can rest in there. I've got a little bit of a recess there because it needs to get plugged in. At a rough guess, this will work pretty well. I've also shaped a little bit of leftover foam that I cut out and put it into these ends. Again, just to stop a little bit of the echoing that you might get inside these chambers. I'm not gonna worry about this end for now where it sort of folds and clicks up, but I figured that just stops a little bit of the reverberation as well. So I think this will actually work quite well. And you sort of end up with a piece that looks like this. And it's not pretty, but it doesn't really need to be. It'll sort of form and compress as you shut the lid down. So I think that actually works quite well. Now, just to show you, this is our foam that I actually used around the outside of the pump. And you can sort of lay, lay it in, press it into place, and then just cut it off wherever you need to to trim it all off. I've also done these tabs that run up through the middle. I've just made a little cardboard template to cut out some foam pieces that go on either side of the tabs just here. And I, again, I just figured that would help cushion it and stop a little bit of the reverberation inside the enclosure. And obviously I've done both sides. So again, it, it can all fold down and it's got a nice foam enclosure inside where the pump goes. Now you mightn't have to do this other foam because the pump will simply sit in like this. Once you put all your fuel hoses and everything in, that'll sort of hold it into place. But I figured the foam will actually support it a little bit and stop it from moving around. So it's all a bit of an experiment, but I think it will work incredibly well. Now with the fuel pump, I've obviously wrapped it all the way around, but I've also put some foam on the back side of it as well, just to cover all the metallic sides of the actual pump itself. So for me, that's the best I can possibly do in regards to trying to silence the external skin of the pump. You obviously still have the lines that come out, but they'll have the rubber hose that goes onto them anyway. While I've got the brackets off, you'll notice one has a little bend going in and the other has a little bend going out. Now with the out one, I just kept manipulating this until they sat roughly in the same plane along this top edge where you're gonna fix it to the underside of the floor. So it's really, really quite simple. You can just put this into a vise, bend it by hand with no drama at all. So what we'll do now is we'll go out and locate this onto the rear of the van on the underfloor and I'll go through the one last important thing you need to consider when positioning these pumps which is the location in proximity to the heater. Because as I discovered, which I was quite surprised by, and we'll cover it here while I'm sitting here and talking about it. My original thinking with these pumps, given they're a push style pump, is you locate them as close to the tank as you possibly can. That's what you would normally do with a fuel system. And this is what I was intending. I was gonna have it located close to the opposite side of the caravan so that it could just pump all the way through to the heater itself. What quite a few people have discovered though, is that the noise is often caused by the pulsing through the fuel line that runs up to the heater itself. So the closer you can get this to your heater, the quieter it will be as well. You can actually position these pumps two meters away from a tank. I know of some that are actually pulling three or four meters from the drawbar to the rear of the van with no dramas at all. So having it in a location that's away from the tank probably isn't such a big drama, but having it as close to the heater as you can, which we've done in our particular instance, will actually, hopefully, fingers crossed, improve the ticking noise as well. So it's all these little factors you can do to alleviate it, mitigate it, and try to keep it as quiet as you possibly can. Let's head out into the van. I'll show you where this is going and how I'm gonna mount it all up. Now it's a little bit tricky to film under here, but you can see this is our heater location where it drops down under the floor. Just over here, we've got a little cable connection point that goes up between the floor, and that's where I'm going to run my harness back through. I'm not sure with the fuel yet. I'm gonna see if I can run that down through there as well, just to keep it all nice and tidy. But in this location here is where I'm planning to put the fuel pump. And you'll see it's in very close proximity. We've got a straight run across to the heater itself, and it should work extremely well. So if I grab my little canister, put it into place, it's gonna sit roughly like this. 
And that should work extremely well because we've got the angle we need, we can run our fuel line directly to the heater, and it keeps it all nicely, discreetly located under the floor of the van while still being really easy to access. I'll probably fiddle around with the location a little bit, but it will sit roughly like this. So for those playing at home, I've mounted the brackets out so the front hole is eight centimetres from the outside. You could probably go a little bit further. I want to keep it as tight against the rail as I possibly can. And the holes are four centimetres apart. So I marked the outside hole, I put a square on, and then measured back four centimetres for the back hole. Then you sort of want to align this bracket as much as you can, mark that hole, and do the same on this side. Now, I'm going to use rubber washers in between, and I've sort of just stuck them on. It sounds a little bit gross, you can just use a little bit of saliva and that'll sort of just get them stuck to the brackets as they come down. And then I've put the screws in from the inside, which should make it a lot easier to fix on because you can just slide them over onto the holes, just like so. And now we can fix it into place. So just like that, we're solidly mounted in place. We put our little foam insert in and then our fuel pump can slot in just like so as well. So that's actually a fairly neat little setup. You can then clip it up into place and you've got a really solid isolated mount for your diesel pump. It's in close proximity to the heater and we're ready to plumb it all up. But first we need to install our diesel tank. So let's head back into the shed. We'll run through that component. Then we'll get into plumbing it all back up. So let's just quickly touch on the standard fuel tank that comes with the kits before I get into a few different options you can look at as well. So most kits will come with a fuel tank that looks kind of like this. There's two different versions. This one's a 15 litre and it's got the spout off to the side, which is what you preferably want. And that will go with an accessory I'm gonna show you very shortly. The other one is gonna be a little bit shorter and it's got the cap located more in the middle. Now the general consensus from people that have used them is that this is much better, depending on where you're going to locate it of course, because you can easily access the side rather than spilling and getting diesel all over the middle if you're trying to access it to this center point of the tank. And again, it's all gonna depend on exactly where you're going to mount something like this. Now the advantage of this tank is that it's supplied in most of the kits, so you've already got your diesel tank with you. There's a few disadvantages that go with these clear tanks, however. The first is obviously the UV resistance of these tanks. So if you're mounting them outside, you wanna protect them from the sun as much as you can. These will degrade just like your clear plastic tubs, fall apart and start leaking, cracking, and all that sort of thing down the track. Now, what they generally want you to do with these is to put a little barb in through the bottom and there's a reinforced sort of area on the sides here and also on the bottom, and that's where you drill and tap through to put a fuel outlet at the bottom of the tank. Now you need to make sure that that is sealed extremely well or else it will leak, but I would highly recommend you replace these tanks. If you do want to persist with one of these tanks and you're manning it outside, I would swap it over for a black one if you possibly can, because the black plastic does seem to be a lot more UV stable. I, I, it's the makeup of that plastic that seems to be a little bit more flexible and malleable, so you don't get the cracking and the deterioration that you typically get with these clear ones. But if you have a clear tank or a black tank, if you mount it externally, you wanna have some kind of protection or guard around it, which will usually form some of the mounting system. So what I've got here is the typical black aluminium guard that you will put around it. And I bought this because at one point I was gonna use a clear tank, but actually mounted inside of our rear boot, which I'm gonna show you shortly. The idea with this is that I could put it around the clear plastic tank. The spout would have come out through here so I had easy access to fill it. And if anything moved around inside the tank and rubbed up against it, it's rubbing up against this guard rather than the clear tank itself. So that's why I bought this, but I'm sure I'll repurpose it for something else. Might even put this into our camper trailer project. I'm not sure yet. The next option is actually one of these stainless steel tanks. Now these stainless steel tanks are provided in a number of the Australian based kits and they're a much smaller capacity of around about eight liters. And most people would carry around a jerry can so you can decant into that if you're doing a longer trip. The only little thing that I don't particularly like about them is they've got this sight tube on the side and sometimes they can leak either through the barb that goes through the shell of the tank or 
from the hose. So just pay a little bit of attention to that if you're looking to buy one, but they're considered a pretty good thing. But if I get this tank out of the way, I'll bring another alternative that we're gonna use in our particular installation. And it is a 10 litre diesel jerry can. Now you could even use a 20 litre if you want. And there's a number of different kits that you can get from Diesel Heat down in Tasmania that I mentioned before to actually turn these into a fully functioning tank for your diesel heater with no dramas at all. Now I actually got a kit and I've already pre-drilled two holes here, which I'll show you right now. All you simply do is get a 24 mil step bit or some other way of drilling into the fuel can itself. You wanna make these holes close to the front so you can actually fit all the other bits and pieces on and you drill one on either side. And that will have your fuel supply to the diesel heater on this side and a little vent tube that comes out on the other side, depending on the tank that you're using. So I've just got a cheap Bunnings tank here. It says Australian made, you can get the same from Super Cheap Auto, Auto Barn and all those sort of things. But you also have the ProQuip branded jerry cans as well. And Diesel Heat actually makes another kit that actually goes on to the filler cap of those ProQuip cans, which is similar to this, just here. Now I bought the kit that I'm using here last year. So I'm not sure if this was available. I probably would have gone that, but I've got a few different pros and cons with both of these kits. The obvious disadvantage with this kit while it's up is that if you want to take the jerry can out, you do need to disconnect it, but they do provide quick disconnects. So I don't think that's such a drama, but obviously to fill it up, you've then got to pull all the internals out with the cap. So to me, it's probably a really good system. Uh, but I think this one will work just as well. To be honest, I did look to actually swap out the jerry can and buy that kit. It's a little bit more expensive. I think it's around about $90 and the one I'm using here is around $80. So you're not looking at much, but they're, vo they're both really, really good kits. And if you are mounting these externally, I've actually got the internal kit, which has a plastic quick connect. They highly recommend you upgrade to their metal quick disconnect as well. But it means you've got a jerry can, you can quickly unplug, remove from your caravan, your camp trailer or anything like that, take it down, fill it up, or even better, if you've got it mounted internally like what we're doing, you can pull it out, you can decant into it, put it back in, and you don't have to worry about spilling any fuel inside, particularly if you're looking to fill a fixed tank. That's something you need to consider. If you're mounting a fixed tank inside your tunnel boot, into a front boot, anything like that, if you do spill a bit of diesel in there, it's extremely smelly and it'd be really hard to get rid of. So let's just finish installing this kit and I'll show you how quick and easy it is to do. Now Diesel Heat actually have a number of different kits on their website if you go and have a look, and I'll link a few of them in the description below. The first is a DIY kit that we're doing here, and that includes this piece that goes into the tank, and it is the feed for the pump and the diesel heater itself. And then you've got a smaller piece with a barb on it, and that is the vent tube that goes onto the second hole. The most important part of the kit is obviously this quick disconnect. So you just press this and you can remove and disconnect and separate the two fuel lines that go between the tank and your diesel heater pump. And they also do a number of kits that are already fully installed. So what we're about to do is all done. You simply buy it and it's ready to place inside your caravan or camp trailer or something like that. And the one thing that they do include with that that I've actually put into my kit as well is one of these. And this is essentially a battery box. So this becomes a really easy way to secure your jerry can into the area that you're looking to mount it. Particularly if you're looking to put it more internally inside the back of an RV into a boot of a caravan, camp trailer, or something like that. If you're using it outside, I'd probably use a more robust steel type jerry can holder, and I'd probably have a 20 litre jerry can rather than the 10 litre. But for us, the 10 litre is good, but this simply allows you to put the jerry can into something that holds it, and more importantly, if you do have some kind of leak when you're disconnecting it, uh, something like that, it contains it inside this box, so it's not gonna leak out into the area that you've got it mounted into. You then want to go through, just deburr the holes that you made, and more importantly, you want to take this cap off and shake any debris from inside, so it's not inside the tank at all. You don't want the fuel pickup right on the bottom of the tank, because especially with diesel, you'll get some sediment that you don't want to be sucking through into your fuel system, particularly with the filters that come with the diesel heaters. They're very fine filters, and you want to make sure you don't get too much debris inside that filter because it will block up and it'll cause you problems when you're operating the system down the track. But we essentially put this tape mark onto the bottom and then these come sort of like this. You just want to straighten the rod out and then we're going to mark it 
and cut it off with the angle grinder. Just like so. Give it a bit of a file. So I've actually got some smaller files which I'll deburr the inside of the tube as well. So to put the breather on, you actually undo the nut and remove all the fixtures off the breather assembly itself. And you do that with the fuel side of it as well so that you can actually get these fittings fitted inside the tank. So we'll take these bits off, including the rubber washer. And then I think I'm going to put the breather on this side. So it simply goes in, clips into place, and then we can put all the fixtures back on and secure this down onto the top of the tank. And voila, we've got our fuel system pretty much installed into the jerry can. So now we've just got some hoses and bits and pieces we'll put onto this. And if you're like me and wondering how on earth you actually fasten these ear clamps that come with the kit, you actually need either some pincers like this or some vice grips. And you simply go onto the ears of the clamp, hence the name ear clamp and you squish it together. Hmm, it's kind of interesting I guess. I'm not sure if I'm a huge fan of them, but that's what comes in the kit and I guess it is a pretty neat looking thing. But these are a one use clip generally. If you look around on YouTube like I just did, you can actually work out a way to squash them back down, but they're generally one use. I guess the idea is once you've got this installed, you shouldn't have to pull it apart again. So this is our breather all on and now we'll just simply put the quick disconnect on and then we should be pretty much done. Another little trick if you don't want to use silicon spray is you can actually dip these hoses into some hot or boiling water. That'll just soften the hose up. Again, particularly when it's cold like we are usually doing these sort of things in winter, make sure you put the other hose clamp on and you can slide it on. But actually the silicon spray works really well. So I'll probably use that for the rest of the installation because that saves having to dunk things in. Everything's wet and it slips around on your hands. But if you are stuck and you don't have silicon spray, some boiling or hot water will make the hose a little bit more malleable as well. Now these don't obviously run any pressure through them. It's really to hold the hose into place to make sure it doesn't come off, particularly when you're going down some rough roads or disconnecting the tank and you're pulling it on it a little bit. So you don't have to worry about it too much but it's quite a neat finish once you get it all installed. So if I put the tank in and strap it down, you'll notice the strap sits off to the rear portion of the tank, which actually works pretty well. It means you're not interfering with all the plumbing that's coming out that we've just installed. It keeps it all nice and neat. Ours will be installed so you access it from this side. So you wanna make sure the buckle is on the right side. Now for those playing at home, the brackets that attach this strap in, I've actually fixed them in with some M5 10 mil long bolts that has some black nylocks on them, just to keep it all nice and tidy. You'll see that I've got to mount this up onto a bit of our packer so that I can clear all our wiring. So let's go out and I'll show you how this is going to be installed before we come back in, run through the plumbing, the wiring, all those little bits and pieces, including a few little tips and tricks. Then we can get this thing up and running and see how it works. Now this is where our installation is fairly specific to this model of caravan because we've got this real handy little storage area down the back of our Jayco journey. It's quite a big area in behind here. We store all our outside gear in here. So our stoves, our muck mat, pretty much everything lives in this little cavernous space that we've got where the ensuite would usually sit in the ensuite model of this caravan. And now because we got this area working really well on our can strip and we've been using it like this ever since, I was really reluctant to put that deeper tank in there, which is why I went back to the standard tank that came with the kit. The problem I found was if you put this in the back here, it sits out into this opening way too far. And I'd already bought the aluminium guard for it. And while it does kind of fit on this side, which you probably can't see in the video, it protrudes too far because in our instance, this opening isn't very big and we need to have the opening clear to get all our gear in and out. That discounted this, which brought the yellow tank back into play and that's where this battery box fits perfect into the back corner with no dramas at all. So you'll notice in here where we're looking to put the fuel tank is that we've got a cable run that runs down around the perimeter of the caravan itself. So I've actually made up this little cardboard template so that I can make a packer to sit the battery box up over the top of those cables so we're not interfering with that at all. So it's a simple case of, again, just marking the floor with some masking tape. Then I put the paper in, make a little template, cut that out and test it. Now I've just transferred that template onto some form ply 
and I'm cutting that out with a jigsaw. Finish it off a little bit just so it's nice and neat. And you can see here it's now mounted to the underside of our battery box. I've added a little packer off to the side just because there wasn't a lot of meat there into the external corner onto the back of the van here. And that will allow all the cabling to run through as they do currently through this slot underneath the battery box itself. So what I've done is I've just half screwed this plywood in so I can sit it into place and then I'll start taking the screws out. I'll drill back into the floor and then put them all the way through. And again, I know this video is getting long, but if anyone wants to replicate this, I'm actually using a 40 mil screw and that should be enough to go through the battery box, through the form ply and into the floor of the journey in this back corner. So our jerry can holders all installed and nicely secured. One thing I did do, which you'll see just here, I've put a little bracket just so I can put the strap up so it's out of the way and it doesn't get caught up with the jerry can. But I can now easily put this jerry can in. When we get the fuel line put in, we can quickly connect it up. And then when we need to top it up, we can easily reach in, pull it out, decan it from another jerry can, take it to the servo, anything like that. And it's a really good, simple, heavy duty system we've got installed into the rear of the caravan, ready to run our diesel heater. So now let's go into the final section, which is plumbing it all together and linking all these major components we've just installed. So let's head into the shed. I'll run through all the final bits of gear and a few little tips and tricks I've learned along the way as well. And now we're after plumbing, wiring, electrical, and the final installation. So this is where things get a little bit interesting and I'll try to cover off a few things while we're in here and then a few other bits and pieces that crop up I'm sure we'll cover up while I get the final install done. So starting with the fuel line, given we just finished the fuel tank off, you'll often see that there's two types of fuel line. The first is this white nylon style fuel line that you get in most of the kits. This is fine to use and a lot recommend you do not change this. Don't change the diameter of it because it's all tuned to the pump and how the injection system works within the heater. However, if you get a kit with the green clear hose like this, it is highly recommended you buy some white nylon fuel line that is suited for the diesel heaters. While we're on the fuel hoses, you get these rubber hoses that link in the nylon to all your fittings and fixtures and stuff like that. I'm going to use this and just see how it goes. But a lot of people do recommend, if you have the time, to actually replace this with proper diesel rated hose. So this mightn't necessarily last the test of time, but I'm going to see how it goes just because I'm halfway through the install and that's one thing I did forget to go and grab. I've got one more thing which we'll mention through this bit as well. You'll find with these installations, and that's where this video should help because it'll consolidate a lot of it together, that you'll be forever running down and buying little bits and pieces to just finish the installation if you're trying to improve it and make it work as well as you possibly can. The next thing is the fuel filters. Now, this is where I've struggled a little bit as well. I'm gonna use the standard fuel filter for now. The one thing that some people have noted is that because this is a two-piece design, it's got a little O-ring in here and it seals together, is that they leak sometimes. Given that ours is mounted externally, I can easily monitor it. So I'm gonna run this for now because I've had a real hard time trying to find a fuel filter that has a similar barb on it. I believe if you go to some mower part stores and stuff like that, you will find something, but just ordering some online, it's a bit hit and miss. And most of them, if you do Google diesel heater fuel line filters, you'll end up with this same style filter. The next thing, which I think most people would be aware of by this point, is the exhaust. So when it comes to the pipework, or any of the pipework really, you wanna minimize the bends that you have in there. I think most of the diesel heater manufacturers, given it's fairly generic, say a maximum of 270 degrees total turns, particularly on the exhaust. Ideally, what you wanna do is just limit the bends that you have and get a more direct path for the exhaust to run out. So this is the standard pipe that you get with your diesel heaters. Look, I'm gonna use it and I think most people have had fairly good success. If you look at a few videos, there's some other pipe that you can actually buy as an upgrade that looks more like a silver version of this foily aluminium intake pipe that you use for both your intake underneath and then your ducting internally, but it would be this 25 mil size. So you can obviously upgrade your exhaust pipe if you want to. 
And I believe this is slightly easier to clamp on to the bottom of the heater unit and also onto the muffler. But for now, I'm going to use this because we've got a very easy to get to straight run out through the side of the caravan and I don't think there'll be any dramas at all. The one thing to bear in mind with the exhaust runs, if I actually straighten this out and put a little bend where it's going to come out from the bottom of the caravan itself, is that you want to get rid of any dips and make it fall down to the muffler. So you don't want to have a dip in this area where it directly comes down outside of the heater and you certainly don't want it running up hill so that you end up with condensation collecting in this lower point. So just make sure that you've got your run so it's going downhill to your muffler. Now obviously while I'm talking about the exhaust, and we'll get into that when we're plumbing it all in, is you don't want your fuel hose sitting right next to the exhaust. So you want to keep them separate as much as you can when they go into the unit because obviously the heat from this exhaust will melt your fuel hose and that also applies to the wiring. And now we'll talk about the muffler. Generally the mufflers are pretty fine. You can get upgraded ones and bits and pieces like that but you know you see some videos where people will actually install a second muffler on. I find the noise from the muffler isn't really a big issue. It, once the unit gets going, it's fairly quiet and it's not all that bad. But again, the one thing you want to note and do when you install the muffler is note that this top section here is where you mount it from. And at the bottom, you'll notice there's a little sort of hole at the bottom of the muffler. Now that is supposed to be the lowest point in reality, but just note that you want to hang it up this way. You don't want a horizontal or anything like that. You need to have it this way so that this drain port is facing the ground and it is the lowest point so any moisture that makes its way in through the exhaust system can drain out particularly when you've got your caravan, camp trailer, RV or anything like that stored away. The other final thing when it comes to these 25 mil pipes, so that's the intake underneath and the exhaust, is that the clamps that come with the kits are generally considered not very good. And you want to get a hose clamp, that's a standard stainless steel wind-in one, like what you have on a lot of your radiator hoses and stuff like that in a car. And the size needs to be 18 to 25 mil, I think it is. I actually got the 25 to 35 and they're a little bit too big. So I do have some, but they're the wrong size for this particular application. I sort of just had a best guess while I was running around a few weeks ago, but I'll definitely update that and they'll be what I'll use as part of the installation. And while we're talking about clamps, I've actually gone and bought these and again I'll link them in the description below if that's what I use and I'm going to use these for the intake and I just think the rubber mounting of these will be a little bit nicer than the standard steel ones that are provided in the eBay kits. I'm, I've also gone and got some Nava P clamps which I'm going to use to actually mount up the fuel line and also the wiring if I need to as well. So you want to tuck everything out of the way. Make sure you've got some zip ties and stuff like that so you can tidy everything up, keep it all nice and tidy. In our case, we're going to run our fuel line primarily through our back cupboard. So I can actually tie this onto the loom that runs in through there that we're sort of following along until we get to a point where we can duck back out through the floor of the caravan itself. But you might need some clips, some cable ties and stuff like that to make the install really, really neat. Now, I mentioned this before, but the intake that comes out of the system, it's sort of the same as the exhaust. You want to, you know, make sure it's fairly tight. It's out of the way of the exhaust. You don't want them running into it themselves. And I'm having it so that this silencer intake, a little filter thing that goes on the end, is facing to the back of the van. If you face it forward and you're going through a lot of mud and stuff like that, you can get a lot of dirt build up around here. So to alleviate that, I'm going to try to have it towards the back, maybe around behind the chassis rail, just to try to keep as much dust and mud out of this as I possibly can. Because it's mounted on the back, you will have some coming up, as opposed to if you mid-mount it, basically between, say, the tow vehicle and the front axle, you won't have so much dirt and mud being flicked up, depending on where you're going, obviously, but that's just another best practice sort of thing to do. I think it's a really good practice to have it somewhere where it's easily seen so you can inspect it and to make sure that we're getting enough air into the system so it's not sooting up the heater itself and causing those issues you get with the diesel injectors gunking up because there's not the right fuel mixture going through. So if we get the wiring loom out now, as a good segue into that, you'll note that the loom actually has a fair bit on it 
and a fair bit of length. So on this loom that goes out here and the brown wires that come off it, that is what goes on to your fuel pump. So this is what we'll tuck down under the floor and connect into our fuel pump that we installed just before. Now I'm probably actually going to have to cut this and re-terminate the wires again because to put this through the floor is quite a big bulky thing. So I'm actually going to feed the wire in. I'm hoping where Jayco run their main looms down. I've actually put uh, external Anderson plug so that we can put a solar panel on and that worked pretty well. So I think I'll use the same grommet and junction box there to run our wiring at least through. I might do that with a fuel line as well. I'll let you know when we get out there if you're looking to do a similar thing on a Jayco caravan or camper trailer. It's pretty easy if you just cut these. Just mark them when you cut them so you can join the, the right brown to brown. There must be a brown with a black trace, but to me, they both look brown. So I'm definitely going to mark these if these are two brown wires. It might not make any difference, but just so I can get the right brown to brown and the other brown to brown if there isn't a black trace on them. Now the other big thing to consider with this is obviously the power cables and I suppose to an extent the earth cable that comes with these units. A lot of people do say it's underrated for what the unit is, but obviously it does have a fuse built in. And what a lot of people will do is they'll fit another circuit breaker so that you can actually disconnect the whole machine from your battery when it's not in use. So if you're running around in summer, you obviously don't need that diesel heater. And it's just good practice to be able to turn that off. I'm thinking about just putting a little switch in so I can switch it on and off. And where that also comes into play is this switch panel. Because you, particularly if you've got little kids, you don't want them playing around and mucking around with it. Now, when it comes to the switch, I might actually mount it in an area under the bed because the other thought is if this unit is running and a child comes along and flicks this switch, cuts all power to the heater, then that's not a very good thing either. And most of the time, you won't be able to get this switch somewhere out of the way of prying hands. Our boys are old enough, we're not going to have that issue. But if someone accidentally bumps it, it probably is a consideration. And given that you only need to switch it on and off once. We'll get into that once we head inside, but that's another consideration. Now with this switch panel, as I mentioned earlier, I have actually done a modification to the mounting plate. And I'll come around and show you that. The operation of them is pretty straightforward these days. I'm not sure if I'll go into it too much. Depends on how long this video is getting. But one thing I have noted earlier in the video is that, and I think it's a little bit clunky to be honest, because they could easily get this wiring harness out through the back of the unit so that we could at least tuck it away so it's not exposed. But I've done a little modification to this mounting plate if we remove this to make things a little bit easier. And I'll show you a little bit of what I've done here. Generally, if we turn it around, I actually started by drilling a hole right near this bottom left-hand mount. So I actually marked where this cable drops down under the display itself. And you'll see in a lot of photos and installs that people have done, they'll just have this hanging down and going in somewhere. I don't want to see any exposed cabling at all if I can get away with it. So that's the idea of this little channel I've cut into the back of the mounting plate. So I started just here, right near where this sort of frame runs around the back of the mounting plate. And that actually I thought would work pretty well, but I've actually extended it <laughs> a little bit just so we can drill a hole because if I bring this back out, obviously we do need to make a hole big enough for this plug to go through. And my thinking is if it's too close to the bottom of this, if you misjudge a little bit, it might be a little bit tricky. So the idea is we can actually tuck this cable back a fair way in behind the actual mounting panel that goes onto your cabinetry or something like that and then it can go down and through. So if we do make a hole it'll be further back from this bottom mount and as I said we can sort of get it through into the back of the cabinetry. In our case I'm going to lo locate this down low under the bottom bunk and hopefully this insulation for the last part goes pretty well. So let's head back out to the caravan get it all buttoned up, see how we go. So this part of the install for me has been really easy so far. The connection point on the opposite side, down under the bunks that Jayco used to run all their cabling and whatnot down through the floor, I've actually been able to use that to run the fuel line up from underneath and through under all the cupboards and into this rear boot hatch area that we've got in our Jayco journey. 
I put the male fitting on that goes onto the tank, crimped it all into place. So now I can plug it into the tank and then start feeding this back through to the other side. So I'll meet you over there and then I'll show you exactly what we've got to do for the rest of it. Now this is the floor under our bunk area and this is where our main wiring harness goes in and out of the floor. It's usually got this plastic cap on it. You simply unscrew that and I've actually been able to bring my fuel line down through it and also the wiring harness for the diesel pump. So what I'll do now is I'll run that around to the actual diesel pump enclosure we put in about probably 10, 15 minutes ago and we'll start plumbing this in. I'll show you a few tips and tricks there. Right, we've got our fuel lines all connected up to the diesel heater running through to the tank that we installed just before. It's pretty easy to do. A few little tips and tricks is to use something really sharp with this nylon line so you're not crushing and squashing the end of it. So I tend to use some side cutters that are really sharp and you just want to make sure that the end isn't all closed up. Now when it comes to the little rubber joiners, same thing, I use some sharp side cutters on that. You can use a knife or something like that. It works just as well and a little bit of silicon spray does help to get that in there but it's a fairly firm fit and I don't think it will leak. I've actually started to bring some diesel through to the pump which we'll touch on shortly but I just wanted to give you a few tips and tricks into running these lines through and getting it all neat and tidy. Now with the compression clamps that come with the diesel heater kits that actually go onto the rubber lines, I actually find using some pliers just like this you can squash them together and then wiggle them up over the rubber line and you can generally get them into place. You just gotta be a little bit patient with them. Otherwise you can swap them over to a screw type one. You just need to make sure that you don't actually over tighten them because you will actually crush the nylon tube inside. Now, one thing I have done that's potentially a little bit wrong and you'll see it just over here is that I've mounted the fuel filter horizontal. Now, if you read the instructions, they say it should be mounted vertically. And I think there's two reasons for that. One is to make sure you don't get air bubbles inside the fuel filter. And two, because it's a two part filter that it doesn't leak out through the seal. Uh, now I know a lot of people that actually mount these horizontal. I was trying to get it on an, at least an angle or something to make it work. Even inside the boot area where I come off the tank, it would have been upside down because we're going down to the floor. So best practice, you want to mount that as vertical as you possibly can. I'm gonna try the horizontal because it's nice, neat, fits in here, it's protected from stones, all that sort of gear. And I've actually mounted it in one of these 27 mil uh, pipe clamps with the rubber surrounding on them. And I'll also use these to mount my air intake that goes into the heater under here, which we'll install shortly as well. I just wanted to show you this and show you how it all works. But inside here, it is actually working really, really well. I've actually turned the pump around a little bit so the harness runs through and out through the bottom rubber grommet of this enclosure. And I've also aligned all the clamps so they sit down into that foam. So I don't have to worry about any sharp edges rubbing through this wiring harness that goes into the fuel pump itself. I've actually also, which is what I wanted to touch on, is actually drawn the diesel through to around about this point. It's probably gone back a little bit now, but you wanna get the fuel down as far as you can to this pump. So when we do the first priming sequence, it's not running dry. And that is a critical step for these diesel heaters. You need to prime the system so the fuel is all running through to the heater. Because if you try to start that heater without the fuel prime done, you could cause a fair bit of damage to the heater itself. You want to try to keep everything wet as much as you can. So how I've actually got the fuel down to this point, and it was incredibly easy, because you've got gravity to a point as well, is that I've just disconnected this nylon hose here and I've literally just sucked it through. You can see it go into the filter, and then I had a tiny little bit in my mouth, but look, it's just something you need to do. Some people have tried using a little pump, like on a boat fuel tank, to the engine, but all the ones I found were way too big. So you might be able to get some little smaller primer, sort of uh, manual pumps there that you could use, but I found it took like three seconds to get the diesel down, fill up the fuel filter, and get it ready to go in. It's no drama at all. I will tidy all this up. I just want to get the system running and then I can button down a few little clamps for the wiring harness and this fuel line just to keep it all nice and tidy. Now with the exhaust, this does actually have a slight fall. Once I clamp this in, I'm going to try to push it up a little bit higher up into the heater and I've actually kept this pipe intact. I haven't cut it down. I've just run it further towards to behind the wheel arch and put it out through the side here, which is fine. That's a really nice tidy run. It's got a bit of fall in the line and I've actually used one of the same L brackets that I used to put the uh, fuel pump enclosure on. So it keeps it all nice and tidy and it doesn't look like it's been cobbled together. I've also used the same M5 bolt and nylock 
to tie it all together and that generally has it all pretty much done. I've got to put the clamps on but I'm going to get the air intake on first and then you can see how it all looks once it's all buttoned up. And then with the air tank I've shaped it something like this and everyone's instance is going to be a little bit different but I'm just trying to tuck it up under the floor which will actually sit in front of the pump. But we're running it backwards down through here so I'm not actually going to put one of these clamps onto the end. I've actually drilled a hole and put a little screw in there because I'm then using the same 27 mil rubber RP clamp and I've done something a little bit different because I need to space it up so that when this clamp goes on the actual snorkel or the inlet of the pipe doesn't actually hang down and look a little bit strange. So I've actually got a rubber furniture bumper from Bunnings. This is the packet here and that actually spaces it up perfectly. I've drilled a hole through it and this will clamp on to the underside of the floor and hold everything in place. Now a little tip and trick for actually getting these fittings onto this aluminium hose is that you pull it out a little bit and squash it down with some pliers so you can pull it over the flange or whatever you're trying to mount it onto. It doesn't seem to be so bad back at the heater side but I do remember when I did our portable heater that was a tip and trick to actually squash this out, stretch it a little bit and it makes it a lot easier to put the ends onto these particular hoses. So the last thing now is to bolt it up into place. I'll show you how it looks. Don't forget to put your pipe clamp on and we'll be ready to go. And it's all nicely installed. Pay particular attention to the orientation of all your clamps and stuff like that. So they're firstly easy to get to and secondly it's all nice and tidy, everything's around the right way and it doesn't look all hodgepodge and cobbled together like what I said before. But with the air inlet I've brought it out so that we're clear of the fuel line, the exhaust and everything and then I've just brought it back in closer to the fuel pump assembly. You can see some witness marks on the back where it's got a fair bit of mud. I'm just trying to get it out of that track while bringing it to the back as far as I possibly can. So hopefully that works pretty well but you just want to be able to get in, monitor it and more importantly clean it out before you go to use it if you're going down some really muddy tracks, dirt roads or anything like that. It'd be a good idea to get a sock that you can put over this air inlet. Something to cover it up while you're in transit. Almost like a little shower cap I guess. And the other thing I will get is a little rubber grommet or a bung to put over the exhaust outlet here given we are just behind the rear wheels that'll cover that up and particularly when you're in storage you don't want wasps or anything building nests inside that muffler and blocking it all up because again that airflow will affect how the diesel heater works and how efficient it is. So now that we've got all this outside stuff done we just need to quickly finish off the install inside and we're pretty much done. Now with your wiring loom you want to lay it out inside the caravan or the space that you're fitting your diesel heater in to work out where things go and to make sure you've got enough wiring there to connect everything up. That's a really important thing because you don't want to have to go extending harnesses. Now in our case because we're in close proximity to the battery we actually had to cut the harness down a little bit just to keep it all nice and tidy. You could actually just manoeuvre it around but in my case I actually had an issue where the negative lead that comes off the plug that goes into the heater itself was too short and it wouldn't actually reach the battery anyway. So what I've actually done is I've created a little bit of a mini loom here which is a really good idea. So I just tidied it all up and I've upgraded the wiring in doing that. I had a slightly better fuse holder so I've added that in and obviously proper terminals that can go onto the battery I've heat shrunk them all on and kept it all nice and tidy. I've then worked out where I'm actually going to run the loom and started stitching it all together around to an area where I've also added in a switch. So this is like a master switch where we can actually turn off the whole system when we're not using it. Some people will use a circuit breaker but as long as you've got a switch that is rated for the amperage that goes through the system so up to 20 amps would work pretty well given that's the fuse that the heaters use a switch will be perfectly fine to turn the unit on and off when you're not using it. So that disables the whole loom, the heater, the display and everything so you haven't got that parasitic draw when you're in storage because the unit will have a bit of a standby mode to it and more importantly it means that people can't be fiddling around and playing with it. So for us this will be turned off most of the time which will disable the whole system. When we go out for a trip and we want to use a diesel heater I can quickly reach under the bed, switch it on and we can run it. So that is a really good thing but I've sort of worked out where that needs to branch out so I can locate it and then that takes me down to the main plug. Now the one thing I do need to do when we get back inside the van is actually connect up the loom that comes up from the diesel pump. Noting I had to snip that off so I could get it through the floor area in between all the other looms. And then lastly the final thing I've done is because my display panel is going to be mounted over on the side 
in front of our battery management system, which is on the opposite side of the batteries, it's going to follow the same path as our main power loom that goes to the batteries. So I've simply connected it all up with some zip ties, keep it all nice and tidy, it can run off to its location, we can plug that in once we get inside the van, and it keeps it all nice and tidy. But I'm actually running along where Jayco has their current wiring loom. So I'm just going to zip tie it back onto where the main loom runs, and that will keep it all nice and tidy, you wouldn't even know it's there. So that's my tip and trick, we'll head out to the caravan now, we'll get this install done. All we've got to do is plug this harness in now, got to put the vents in, and obviously run the ducting through and we should be pretty much done. And now I've just quickly put all the wiring in just so I could connect the batteries back up so I've got some light. Now you'll notice I've also skipped ahead and actually drilled the holes in down here for our outlets. So that takes us on to the next step which is putting in our ducting, mounting our outlets, the control panel and getting it all to look nicey nice from the outside. Now running the ducting can be a little bit complicated Again, you don't want to have too many bends and too many tight bends. I probably do have a bit of a tight bend here, but I think it will work. And as per the smaller ducting we used outside, this can actually be stretched out. So if you need to reach somewhere, you can easily stretch this out and manipulate it really, really easily. Now to get it over onto the outlets, you simply get your pliers and squash this down all the way around. And that will make it a lot easier to slide over the ends of the heater and also the outlets when we go to plumb it all in. So this duct here, which runs from the heater, will come out through this hole here, which is on the back side of our particular caravan. Now you'll notice I've got another hole here. Now I've decided to put this outlet down here because I felt it would look a little bit odd sitting right next to the heater outlet. So the idea of the second hole here is that it will actually recirculate the air back into the heater it warms it up and then shoots it back out into the space. Now for those that are traveling in really cold climates, the advantage here is that we're actually drawing some warm air back under this bed. And most with bunk beds will note that the lower bed gets quite cold. So this will actually introduce some warm air underneath the bed itself, which should be a big bonus as well. It's not a really big thing, but the big thing really is drilling these holes. So for those playing at home that are trying to replicate this, I've actually measured down 120 mil, and that's got the center line for all my outlets down along this lower panel. Now you need to look behind to make sure there's nothing you're going to drill into, the same as how we did our floor penetration. And so I do like to do a pilot hole just to double check and you can sort of work out where things are spatially. In my case, I'm sort of lining up and going just to the side of these braces that run through for the bed on either side. And then I've drilled my pilot hole through. Now that's a good thing because where my control panel going is right near our J35 or our J-Hub. And there's a bracket there that it probably would have clashed with. So I've been able to move it just a little bit to the side to clear all that because it's pretty tight down in that space. Now as far as drilling these holes you need a 60 mil hole saw and the same as before start by going in through the back and then finish it off by going in through the front. Then you just want to give it a little bit of a sand to tidy it all up make sure it's all nice neat and tidy but I will note with these veneers that you have inside the caravans be very very careful. You don't want to mark the outside of it or really go too close to it because it is very easy to damage this veneer and put some marks on it. And the same applies to tape. I wouldn't use tape unless you know exactly where the hole is going. Because if you pull that tape off, you can pull a bit of this veneer off as well. So anyway, we've got our three holes drilled. I've got two large ones here, which are the 60 mil. And then I've got one over the other side, which is which we'll get to later, which is for our control panel. And I've used a 20 mil spade bit for that. Now we're up to actually putting these vents in. Now one thing I have noted with the kit in particular that I got, and a few others have noted the same, is that I didn't really get any hardware to mount any of this stuff. So if you're prepping to do a diesel heater install, uh, just go and make sure you've got all the hardware, so screws and bits and pieces to put all this together, or else you'll find you'll be doing a lot of trips down to Bunnings or your local hardware store as you go through the install. So you will need some little screws to actually mount these in, and just note that the thickness of this ply isn't all that thick. So I've actually got some of these 3.5 by 16 mil long screws. They're black, which will match in with the vents even though you don't see them. And again, for those that don't know, the covers for the vents actually just pop off. So you can just lever them off and that gives you access to the holes. You mount it in, line it all up how you want it, drill your holes. I always pilot drill holes, no matter with what I'm doing, I just find you get a better finish with that. 
put your screws in, and then you can clip your covers back on. Now these covers do rotate around, so you can actually direct the air in the direction that you want. So there is a little bit of adjustability once you put it in. Get the duct all connected up to it, then we'll mount the control panel. So this is the opposite end of the bunk area, and then also you can see our fridge here. We've got a little fixed panel that comes out, which is really good because I can actually mount the control panel down here, and it's protected a little bit by this panel protruding out. Now what I've done is I've just made a 20 mil hole on the side, and that is large enough for the plug to fit through, so we can connect it up to the rest of our harness. And it's in a location that works with this little cutout that I've made on the mounting plate. So how it will work in our instance is I need to run the cord through to connect the plug up, then this will slide in over the top, and then we can actually mount our control panel into place without too many dramas at all. But before I do the final mount up, because I don't want to pull this all apart again, I'm going to show you through turning the machine on and how this control panel works. And now we're getting into actually getting this thing set up and working. So I've actually mounted my switch over here which means I just need to reach under the bed every time I need to turn that on and off, but it's not gonna be a regular thing. If you wanted to, you could have it a little bit closer to the sides, but for me, it worked pretty well over there. All I simply do is switch this on, and now the system is live, which is pretty exciting. And now you can see with the power connected that the control panel is now operational. Now, it's taken me a little while to work this one out, again, because the instructions aren't very good, and our control panel is a little bit different to a lot of the ones you see on YouTube. So they're forever changing, and it takes a little bit to get your head around. Now the most important thing to do before you start is to actually prime the pump. Now some of them will actually say you press these two lower buttons to prime. In our case, we actually press the up and down button consecutively. So you just hold them in, and that will start the priming sequence. So I'll do that now. And you can hear the pump tick, 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 tick in the background. It'll keep pumping until it's primed. In our case, I've been running this unit, so it's already primed and it's done its job. So it's very important you do this step first before you start the machine up, just to make sure you don't cause any damage. Now to help you out, if you're trying to follow the instructions for your particular unit, they call the priming function the manual oiling. So where it says manual oiling, just press the buttons that it recommends and that will prime the system. You'll see the little fuel pump icon come on and that indicates that the fuel pump's running and it's priming the system up. Now our display is actually really, really straightforward and simple. We don't have any of the hertz or anything like that. It obviously has a thermometer function in it because it's telling us the ambient temperature in here, which is 25 degrees at the moment. So it's pretty warm. And the P means that we've got 13 volts at the battery, which is going into the unit. So that's a good sign that our batteries are in good condition and they'll run the unit with a startup. Now I can't do too much from this screen at this point until I actually turn it on. So normally you'd hold this in and that will take you to a temperature setting or a fan setting. So what I'm going to do is actually power this unit on. And you'll see here a H3. So that is a fan setting of three. And you can hear the fan going in the background. So what you do in our case is you just hold this setting button in again. And it will actually take you to the temperature that I've got it set at. Now I've actually got this set at 34 degrees. So the other problem solving thing, if the diesel heater isn't igniting, is that you go back to the fan settings and we actually wind this up until you see the bars going red. And hopefully that actually starts the heater up, which you can hear in the background. It'll go into a startup function where it will run really loud for a few minutes and then it will settle down. Once this gets running, what I'm gonna do is actually turn the fans down and that will settle the whole heater down. So you make it around Three, I find, is a very happy medium. Depending on where you are, how cold it is, you might wind it down to two, or bring it up to like four or five. But as you can see here, the bar goes up, and then it hits the red, and that is what will actually trigger the diesel heater and the igniter and everything inside to get going and go through its normal function. So we'll let it start up. I'll wind it down a little bit, and I'll show you the sound test from outside, because that little fuel pump enclosure works incredibly well. I'm just going to refilm this little bit. You can just hear the pump going, and you haven't got the exhaust screaming. So you'll note when I finish this video off that the ending, it's running at full pelt. I finally worked out the instructions so I can turn the heater down, and that's quieting the whole thing down quite a lot. I've got a very slight vibration from the exhaust, but 
the fuel pump. It's pretty quiet, I would say. I don't know if you can actually hear it in this video. Let's just see. You just hear it tick, tick, ticking. But I do want to fix that little rattle in the exhaust. But I think this is a nice, tidy and neat success. I'm pretty happy with how that turned out. So with the heater idling along, it's quite warm coming out of here because I've still got it set at 34 degrees just to make sure it doesn't turn off while I'm doing this little test. But it's actually fairly quiet. To be honest, you're always going to have some noise because you've got the fan there. I don't know if you can hear it, but you can just hear the pump. So I might actually put some rubber under those brackets just to make sure there's no noise transfer coming up. But you're probably going to hear something. I think with these lids down, the mattress on, it's going to be really, really quiet. And now to shut the system down, you simply press the power button in for another two seconds. That'll turn it off and you'll start hearing the system ramp up as it goes through its cool down process. This is a point where it's super critical not to cut power to the heater unit itself because that will cause a lot of damage to the unit, cause it to soot up and create a whole heap of issues down the track. So if you can, just let it do its shutdown sequence, which will take three or four minutes. Then if you need to, you can cut the power to the unit, pack it all away, and then you don't need to worry about it anymore. I'll just show you how this panel sits down underneath and we're pretty much done. We've pushed our cable through and that hole worked incredibly well. The last step is to click the panel on and we are done. That's a good feeling. It sits down here. It's not gonna blind anyone if it's on at night time with a display and it should work incredibly well. So we're finally finished the install. If you made it this far, I thank you very much for watching because I know this has been an incredibly long video, but hopefully it gave you a lot of advice and handy tips and tricks to install your own diesel heater and all the options that are out there. And now how good is that? You can hardly hear the pump, which I'm really, really happy about. The one thing I will change is I think I will mount that fuel filter onto the side structure there, just so I can tilt it a little bit. It's not affecting the operation, but I can see that where it's drawing the fuel out of the filter, it's sitting around about level. So it's not quite filling the top of the filter up. So I think if I just tilt it a little bit, that'll make it that little bit more reliable without too many dramas at all. Now it's a fiddly job. You could probably get it done over, you know, a day if you wanted to, but just beware that you'll probably be missing little bits and pieces. So you'll have to make a few runs to the hardware store. So I'm gonna wind this up now because I know it's getting incredibly long. But one thing I always say is if you've got any comments or feedback on this install or anything else to help people out that are installing these diesel heaters, put it down in the comments below. I think some constructive criticism is always good to help everyone improve the systems that they're installing. And I think that helps everyone out in the community that's looking to install one of these diesel heaters. But for now, I'm gonna go and turn this off because it's gonna be incredibly hot in there. So thank you all for watching. And as I always say, get out there, stay safe, have fun, and we'll catch you next time. Oh,